شكرا شكرا Okay. Thank you, Professor Pape, for such a great um, lecture. Very much needed in Berlin. Um, yeah, and refreshing. Thank you. Okay, so we are now um, at the um, moment where we're going to have a conversation. A um, few questions uh, from to Professor Papi um, to hear his uh, point of view. And then later on we will open up the floor for a few questions also from uh, the audience. Um, so I'll start from where you've ended, um, talking about the limits actually of the lobby. Um, and some people do understand today the role of the United States, uh, like the United States having actually strategic or deep strategic interest in the area, and it's beyond just the lobby. Uh, and actually, the, the, uh, they would interpret the recent uh, uh, developments, uh, the genocidal onslaught of Israel in Gaza, um, exposing these deep um, strategic interest. How would you respond to that? The strategic interests of the United States until now definitely include unconditional support for Israel. It doesn't mean that America tells Israel what to do all the time. But it means that even when Israel takes independent decisions, the power of the lobby is that America would adapt itself to the Israeli policies rather than reject them. So I don't think the United States gave an order to Israel to genocide the people of Gaza, unless, of course, one day we'll find documents about it. But it's very clear that the moment it, was, uh, it, it transpired that Israel is committing a genocide or using the events of the 7th of October as a pretext for committing genocide, you would know beforehand that the United States would not stop it. This is the dialectic of, of this relationship. Uh, and um, it really means that um, it is not so much the American, or it's not so much translation of the American interests in Palestine that are the reason for the oppression of the Palestinians. It is because Israel has immunity in the United States, America would never stop it from doing what it does in Palestine. You had few presidents like uh, Obama and Carter and maybe few uh, senators and so on that thought that they get away with it by at least talking differently uh, about the Israeli actions, namely condemning it. But Israelis understood very well that words are not very important here, only deeds, only actions. And we've seen it throughout the American reaction to what was going on uh, in Gaza. Not only the genocide of the people of Gaza, but also the killing of American citizens who were part of the human rights organization trying to, pe to help the people of Gaza. They were also sacrificed by the United States for this idea that Israel serves better than anyone else in the Middle East, the American national interest. And the American national interest has not changed. The Amer 25 of, uh, percent of the American energy sources comes from the Middle East. Uh, much of the uh, capital that Americans invest outside of the United States is in the Middle East. It's an imperialist asset for, for the United States. It doesn't have only Israeli. Israel is an ally, as we know. 
It has other allies <laughs> in the Middle East. So I would just say, and one thing I always say in the United States, when people ask me, do you foresee in any time in the future a dramatic change in the American policy? Are you optimistic that one day, you know, a president in the United States would uh, talk reasonably about Israel and Palestine and would change the policy? And I say, first, I always hope because I don't know what's going to happen in 30 years. Who knows? Maybe. But I do would like to ask for a more practical uh, ambition, whether I talk with God or with whoever is in charge on what would happen next 10 years. I've never figured out uh, uh, finally who is in charge. But um, I would say at least convince the Americans not to be in the Middle East. Don't change the policy, but get out of the Middle East. Okay. Um, you have touched upon tonight, but also have said before uh, that you are foreseeing now or feeling that it's the beginning of the end. And I would like to unpack a little bit with you. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by the end? Is it the end of the image of Israel as a liberal democratic Zionist state in the world, or especially in the Western world? Or do you actually see an end to a certain uh, apparatus of a state, a structure, where people would come to understand um, that this is um, not working anymore as a political project? First of all, I, I think we are at the beginning of the end. And this is not just, uh, which is good, but it's also a dangerous moment. When he, an historian talks about the beginning of something, we usually think, unfortunately, of a long period, not a short period. So it can take a while, because it's the beginning of a process. And it's dangerous, because the project that is disintegrating will do all it can to survive. And if it didn't have any inhibitions before, it would have even less inhibitions now if it would feel, as I think most of those who hold power in Israel feel, that they are facing an existential danger as a, as a fanatic racist Jewish state. Now, what do I mean by an end? I think we have good examples in history uh, for various models of end. You can have a disintegration of a state that becomes a failed state, a state that cannot provide for the most elementary needs of its society, cannot even defend very well its society, can definitely not uh, invest in the society, and that it has a problem with its own society. Maybe people would leave. Maybe people would fight each other. I, I'm not trying to predict the scenario because I can't. But I do have historical examples. We have a change of regime in South Africa. That's one possibility. We have the state of South Vietnam that disappeared in a few weeks. Uh, we have Syria disintegrating. We have Libya disintegrating. Uh, we have to remember, Israel is in the Middle East. Uh, Israelis think that they are in Europe, but because of the Eurovision. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're not in Europe. I was trying to say to them for 50 years, but uh, they, they, they don't agree with me. They think that they are in Europe. And uh, they are part of the same problems that you know, affect everyone in the Eastern Mediterranean. This political structure that the colonial powers created after the First World War, based on the European idea of a nation state, is not working. Not only in Palestine, it's not working in Lebanon, it's not working in Syria, uh, it's not working in the Yemen. Yes, it, it seems to work where there are strong monarchies, but that's also uh, a question about the future. So I can see scenarios already that's happening elsewhere can happen in Israel as well. And then I know from history there's a moment where suddenly it is accelerated. Look at South Vietnam when suddenly everybody's trying to get out. Or when apartheid South Africa came to its very last breath. 
So yes, this is what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, w what I do with this idea is not to say that I know exactly how it would happen. I'm just saying this is the correct conversation. And we need to have this conversation because if you go to the German foreign ministry, if you go to the EU foreign ministry, if you go to the American State Department, even to the United Nations, people would say to us, no, the important conversation is a two-state solution. Uh, because we have such a good example for a Palestinian state in the West Bank, really something that people would write about in history book. There was never such a good state like this one. And we want to have a similar state in Gaza. And uh, this would be peace. That's, that's the conversation. That is the conversation. And I'm saying, sorry, guys, this is a conversation about that Palestine that you know about and I don't know about that probably exists somewhere else, maybe on the moon. The Palestine I know has nothing to do with the two-state solution. The Palestine I know has to do with decolonization. <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about. Okay, since we are talking about decolonization, um, I have a question about um, the Palestinian liberation movement, uh, which you've also uh, mentioned today in your lecture. So the Palestinian liberation movement clearly offers Palestinians a path forward uh, toward liberation, toward justice, and the end of oppression. What does it offer, or should it offer, in your own uh, point of view, to Jews who are living between the, the river to the sea, beyond maybe the obvious and important moral benefit of rejecting <coughs> being a settler? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not going to suggest to the Palestinians what to say. It's up to them. My point is different. My, my point is slightly different. I'm saying the Palestinians have to tell the Jews how they see them in a decolonized Palestine. I'm not going to tell the Palestinians what to tell the Jews. Uh, but, but I do think, uh, if, and that's what I do, that I hear enough already from young Palestinians in particular who are thinking about these issues that I can begin to see the picture of what we are kind of involved in when we are in a good day imagining a better future. I don't think we envisage 8 million Jews leaving because Palestine is free or Palestine uh, has been decolonized. I think we realize that some Jews would feel uncomfortable, Israeli Jews that is, not living in an apartheid state anymore and not having the privileges and maybe even painfully have to return some land, some resources and so on. But I do see these are millions of people. I can see them staying, and especially the Jews who came from the Arab world, and realizing that actually there is a model here that doesn't come from Europe. It comes from the Eastern Mediterranean, where people learn to respect collective identities in a genuine live and let live coexistence. Well, yes, you can have your collective identity, but you cannot impose it through colonialism and apartheid. And, and I think this would be better, definitely for Jews who came from the Arab world, it would be much better to stop denying their Arabness. They keep denying that they are Arabs, as if the, this is something that is, is, is not good for them. The de-Arabizing themselves was not good for them. And I think this can happen with a certain Palestinian approach uh, to the future. I fully understand it's not the most urgent thing for the Palestinian national movement right now to tell the Jews how they would live in a decolonized Palestine. I'm just saying that this is a good topic to think about. There are more urgent, probably, assignments for the national movement uh, right now. But it would be good to, to, to hear more about it. I think it would help uh, uh, the decolonization, not uh, uh, undermine it. 
Um, you claim in your book that, I'm quoting, the Palestinians were not the challenge, the challenge was justifying what was done to them. Um, and you were talking about the lobbying uh, forces. And that Israel considers, again, another quote, the question of Palestine as a resolved issue. Um, is there is a consensus within the Israeli society on this statement? And do you find it true to this current political moment? Yeah, I think last year showed that uh, in some Isra Israeli Jewish uh, parts of society, uh, the idea that the uh, conflict is over were shattered by uh, uh, Tufan al-Aqsa uh, operation on the 7th of October, for sure. And the fact that the war is going on for more than a year, uh, it would be a bit insane to say the conflict is gone when the war is going on for more than a year. I mean, people live in some cognitive dissonance but there is there's a limit, and when you are not when you're over the limit, you should not uh, walk free in the streets. Um, so I don't think that uh, 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 this is totally true. But what bothering me is what is the conclusion from that? I would think that the conclusion is we thought the conflict has been resolved; it still exists. Maybe we need a different approach. Now, the only group in Israel that offers a new approach are the neo-Messianic Zionists who are part of the government. They say, yes, you're right, the conflict is continuing because you are not listening to our idea. And our idea is to do to the West Bank what we did in Gaza, to do, the Palestine, to, do to the Palestinians in Israel what we did in Gaza, and deter the whole region with a good regional war to make uh, the area fearful of Israel. But they're not the only ones in Israel who are politicians, who, who have ideas. So the others who have different, supposedly should have different ideas, don't really bring anything new to the table. They say, yes, we may have been wrong. The conflict continues. So their message to the Israeli society is even more bizarre in a way. I mean, the first one is really frightening, but the other one is really bizarre. Is they say, OK, we were wrong. Probably, as an Israeli Jew, you will have to live uh, in the next 50 years in a conflict, war after war, and you will have to win all these wars to, to survive. And then they are surprised that even Palest Israelis who are not even thinking about the Palestinians are coming to Berlin in great numbers. Because who wants to live, unless you're totally ideologically committed to this, in a state that says to you in the next 50 years, what you have experienced in 2024 is what you want to experience, will experience year after year. So people who have European passports, people who have jobs that can be reignited elsewhere, would say, no, in 2024, I don't have, I don't have to live. If, this is, if they are right, and this is what the future entails, I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here. And that's happened. We don't know the official number of Israeli Jews who left uh, since uh, uh, October 2023. But uh, all kinds of journalists in Israel who have connect and connection to the Bureau of Statistics, claim that the number is between half a million and 700,000. That's a huge number for a society of 8 million. It's a huge number. And uh, even if the number is lower, we all understand there's a massive emigration of a particular group of Jews. Of course, the Messianic Jews are not leaving. The Arab Jews are not leaving because they don't have dual nationality. So a certain important section of the European Jews and the descendant of European Jews uh, are leaving. And uh, I don't know why I'm talking about it. What, what we were talking about, because I like to talk about it. Uh, it gives me hope. But um, I, know, I remember. the question about the Israel. Yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember your original uh, question now. 
Yeah, it is connected. It is connected. It is connected. It's, it is connected. It's relevant. It is relevant. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, before opening up the, um, the floor to the questions from the audience, I'll ask you, since you mentioned bizarreness, maybe we move to Germany. Um, <laughs> Um, because I, in your book, you don't, you do not delve into the role of the lobby uh, in in Germany or in mm -hmm. other parts in, in Europe, and you dedicate the book to the United States and the United Kingdom. That's right. Um, now, knowing generally, we do understand that maybe the lobby does not work within uh, the same lines uh, here in in Germany, and they maybe employ a different methods, if at all they need to. So I would like to understand what's your take uh, uh, on that and what the German, what the role of Germany and why are they playing this, uh, the current role, uh, which is quite extreme and in ways more extreme than the United States, despite the fact that the United States um, uh, gives and continue to give Israel much more money and uh, in aid, uh, financial aid and in uh, ammunition. Yeah. I think there's something about the nature of politics that we have to, to understand, and politicians in particular. There are moments where politicians take strategic decisions, namely very important decisions, because something dramatic happened in their country. But once that decision is taken, the governments that come after the big event, unless there is a similar event of the same proportions, do not tend to change the decisions that were taken. I saw it in Israel. For example, the government that ruled Israel in 1967 decided that the West Bank and the Gaza Strip will always be part of Israel. The question was, how will it remain part of Israel? And not one government, left or right in Israel, deviated from this idea. In a similar way, the new Germany that was rebuilt after the Second World War, its leaders in the West, and because of the reunion, it affected also the leaders, the, the, the political system in the East, took a very conscious decision with the help of the United States about its relationship with Israel and the Jewish people. The Palestinians did not were not calculated at all in this. And the idea was the following. It is very beneficial for the United States that wants to lead the West in the Cold War, and very beneficial for West Germany that wants to denazify its image, if not totally denazify all the political system, to, um, to accept the Zionist claim that the Jewish state is the only representative of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. So you don't deal with any organization of Jews who are not part of the state of Israel. And if the state of Israel, as the ultimate representative of the victims of the Holocaust, says there is a new Germany, Germany is willing to give Israel everything. And if you look at the history, it is very surprising that I think it was the first, maybe the second, but I think it was the first state, Israel, that recognized a new Germany. I mean, after the Holocaust, you could have been number three, <laughs> at least, <laughs> number five. To be the first, to recognize in 1952 a new Germany, Incredible, if you think about it. But this is part of, of this uh, very historical alliance that very few politicians are willing to deviate from. So you don't need a lobby that, that much until, until certain periods in history, first of all in West Germany, with some of the more radical groups and some of the more uh, conscientious groups on the left, uh, feel liberated from that alliance and identify with many anti-colonialist movements in the third world, including the Palestinian one. So you begin to, but they deal with it quite well without a powerful lobby, you know, kind of terrorizing 
in, in the sense of saying these are terrorists, so we don't have to worry. The, the German public as a whole would not uh, uh, be very attracted to them because of the tactics that they were using. Okay, they were, this went over, but again, I come back to my lecture. People in Germany are as normal as anywhere else in the world. And therefore, they knew also what was going on in Palestine. One of the most interesting things that the Israelis find difficult to understand is that groups of young Germans who came to Israel in this project which was called Vida Gutmachen. And they first came to, to work in the kibbutz, to volunteer, uh, working with social services. But, you know, there were curious young people, so they also went to the West Bank. They also met Palestinians who were citizens of Israel. And because they were in the mood of Vida Gutmacher, namely they were, there was a moral consciousness here that drove them to work in Israel, they began to ask themselves, wait a minute, what about these people? And that's when Germany, or the, the Israel understood it needs a lobby in Germany as well. He never thought it needed a lobby, but it began, I remember when it began, it began uh, uh, after Munich, the Munich operation in 1972. Uh, the Israelis were convinced that because of what happened in the Olympics, Germany is a different story. You know, after the, the, the operation of the Palestinians in Munich, everyone in Germany would be pro-Israeli. Uh, pro There's no problem with that. But they didn't notice that the rest of the world already was looking at the, Palest at the PLO as a legitimate liberation movement. The United Nations was about to pass a resolution that equated Zionism with racism in 1975. The decolonized world that was not present in the United Nations when it declared Israel in 1947, the decolonized world said, no, no, Palestine is part of the liberation project of the world. And that affected also public, certain sections of public opinion. So I think you are facing a lobby that is institutionalized. It is not as old as the lobbies in America and in Britain. Uh, and therefore, I think it is also less effective. Although I, don't, I know it doesn't sound like this, but it is, it is less effective. Uh, and um, it uh, doesn't, it, it works on the assumptions that if you mention the word Holocaust, everybody would be silenced. Nobody would talk about Palestine. And I can understand it. I can understand because uh, my parents uh, lost all their family in the Holocaust in Germany. So I can understand what it does to people. But I also understand that it takes you sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks, sometimes two years, sometimes two decades. And one day you wake up and say, wait a minute, they're doing this as manipulation. They don't care about the Holocaust. They don't care about the Holocaust memory. They don't care about Elon Pape's family that they killed and took all that belonged to us. They don't care about that. They are working for the Israelis by scaring people so that they continue to give Israel immunity for occupation, ethnic cleansing, and colonization. And at that moment, you say, wait a minute. If you want to have a webinar, of what Germany did to the Jews, I'm the first one to be the keynote speaker there, if you want me. But if you want to have a webinar what Israel does in Palestine, don't, don't fuse these two webinars. They're not connected. They're not connected. That's it. Thank you. Um, we'll open up the floor if there are um, some questions. If not, I have a long list <laughs> still to go. <laughs> yeah, OK. So I see uh, already two hands in the back. So the people with the vests, let me see you, the red vests, so you can give the mics uh, to, um, yeah. So let's start with the, um, here, yeah, she's waving. 
Yeah, I, I saw the hands. Okay, Fantastic. there was here, here, three, four, okay. Uh, good evening and a lot of thanks, uh, Professor Ian Papi, for, uh, for such a clear voice we need it in our world. Allow me to ask you quickly many questions. You are free to answer the ones you like. Why USA today sending weapons to Israel? Is it the USA colonization arm in the Middle East and the East? Uh, why Israel arising, deleting Gaza? Is it about the gas in the Mediterranean in front of Gaza? Why decolonization is not reaching its goals to free the people and the land? Uh, how do you explain that Germany allowed you to enter Berlin, but not allowing <laughs> ato, ato, ato. Yeah. and not allowing Dr. Gastan Abu Setta to enter Berlin? Each time I heard about how Jewish will be in free uh, Palestine. It's going to be hard to remember all of them. Can you? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, last question and quickly. Each time no, I hear actually, about. We want to answer you, so if you want to stop and then give him. A... Uh, okay, go last ahead. Last question. Uh, each time I hear about the Jewish will be in free Palestine, how they will be, I must say why we don't look at the Arab world before the Zionists establish uh, their state in, the, in Palestine, how we don't look about the living together in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Palestine, in Morocco, in Tunisia, etc., till the Zionists come and bump the Jewish neighborhood in the, in the cities of these countries. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll give the uh, mic, there was, uh, yeah, uh, behind her, uh, the guy over there. Yeah, should I ask now or? Yeah, please, we will take three or so, four questions and yeah, I'll try I'm to. I'm really happy to hear uh, this kind of like optimistic view about like a failed or disintegrated state. But I would, uh, and also the relevance of that to, histo to historical uh, anchors or like examples. But I, I think that this example is a bit different because of the, uh, the interwoven lobby in the economy and the politics and the war machine outside that is like endless supplies to Israel. So how do you see this kind of like um, happening or evolving in the future into a failed or a disintegrated state while all these businesses around the world are supporting it, the lobbies are like deeply uh, in all the countries basically in the economies, the politics, and uh, how do you see this step? How do you see this people losing the connections with Israel and then leading to a failed and disintegrated mm -hmm. states based Thank on you. history? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me see the vest. Okay, so uh, there is one on the, in the middle. And then when we come, yeah, we will come to the front. And please. Be precise and one yes. question. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pape, for bringing us hope to Berlin. Um, I have uh, one question in regarding um, the, the optimistic view. Um, I am a bit, uh, I, when I think, uh, I'm not a historian, when I think of uh, Australia or Amer of the United States or Canada, I think of uh, complete, uh, completed colonization mm -hmm. processes in a certain sense. And I do not see a plausible way of decolonization in those situations, I mean, to a certain extent. And so I, I wonder, um, looking at those cases, uh, how, how would you justify your optimism? Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is a question. And, um, and also I, I would ask, ask you what you think of, uh, I mean, I, uh, last week, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Moshe Machover, um, also from Israel, founder of uh, Mats Pen, gave, gave a talk here in, um, for a German leftist organization, and uh, he is very pessimistic. And so, um, I, I would, he talks a lot about trying to, to talk to the, uh, trying to reach out to the Israeli working class in a socialist sense. So I, I would wonder what your ideas are about this strategy. I don't know if you maybe, I'm sure you know more about it. Yes, thank you. Yeah. My phone, maybe. Uh, oh, another, another one, another one, but it. Okay. Uh, so uh, we will come here to the front, please. Sorry, I'm trying to be in order, okay. and then we'll move to the other side, and then here and. Hello, Professor Pape. Uh, so I often find myself wondering about the uniqueness of the situation we have in Palestine, and surely there are multiple dimensions you can look at it from whether it's the massive power imbalance, the incredibly powerful lobby behind it, 
the fact that it was a settler, that Israel is a settler colonial state uh, that was incubated and enabled and still continues to be enabled by the world's greatest powers. Um, but uh, from, let's say, from a historical perspective, how unique is actually the situation um, that we have with this particular political project? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So for this round, please just give the mic for the lady in the front and then um, we'll try and give him the opportunity the to answer. Yeah. Okay. So should I wait or ask? No, no, no. Oh, okay. And um, your voice. Okay. Um, thank you again, echoing what everyone has said. Um, so there was something that you talked about um, in terms of like pre-67 or pre-48, there was just this maybe like lack of awareness on the issue of Palestine. Um, and I know for me also as an American, growing up so many of my friends had no idea anything about Palestine. They just knew it was like that complicated thing over there. Um, and since the seventh, obviously this entire thing has been documented on social media for everyone to see. Um, and so on one hand, there's this kind of consciousness raising that I see happening with people that I never expected mm -hmm. to even utter the words Palestine or to know the difference between Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned is this sort of denial that exists of reality within Zionist lobbies. Oh, I'm going to try not to talk about American politics yeah. because it's a whole other like maddening thing that happens. Um, and unfortunately, these are the people that are still in power, right? So you see the White House foreign press secretary answering questions about what's happening in Rafah or wherever, what we just saw last week. And they're using these same like talking points that actually make me want to go crazy. And so I wonder to what end does this denial go on and how do you see that changing and shifting if all of the things that we've seen documented isn't enough? Yeah. Thank you for all your uh, excellent uh, uh, questions. Uh, let me explain what I mean in, in terms of the difference between disintegration and decolonization. It's very important to understand the difference. Disintegration is the failing of a state. Maybe it uh, is affected by a civil war. Maybe it is affected by international sanctions. Maybe it is affected by people leaving it. Uh, maybe it is affected by constantly being involved in violence and more violence and so on. This is part of decolonization, but this is the part where actually the anti-colonialist movement is not responsible for that. The problem of the Zionist project are not just the problem of dispossessing the Palestinians. The whole idea of a Jewish national identity is not working. If you look at the civil war that was in Israel before the 7th of October, which had nothing to do with the Palestinians. In fact, the two camps made it very clear that they are fighting for the spirit of Israel. And when people thought from abroad, oh, you mean whether you continue the occupation or not? They said, no, no, the occupation is over. That's OK. That's not the issue. The issue is, does a Jewish state mean a liberal democratic state? And I would say, and an apartheid state? Or does it mean a theocratic state and an apartheid state? And that debate is insoluble. They don't know how to solve it. That's why they are disintegrating, not because uh, uh, the Palestinian liberation movement is defeating them. I said that the Hamas action gave like an earthquake, a big blow to the cracks in the building. But the cracks are not all to do with Palestine. The cracks have a lot to do with the fact, and this is a lesson to everyone also in India, <laughs> you cannot redefined religion as nationalism. Yeah. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But this kind of disintegration uh, has to be replaced by something better, 
by de proper decolonization. And that's the role of the Palestinian National Movement, to be united, not to be fragmented, to be organized, to have a clear vision, not to talk about two states, to talk about one state, a right of return, and so on. To have a clear Palestinian message, like the ANC had a clear message to the world, what does it mean to end apartheid? And then you can replace the vacuum, or fill the vacuum, or the void, that this is going to happen. Secondly, I don't agree that Australia and the United States are the example that we should follow. First of all, the genocide and the settler colonialism in those countries began long time before uh, the one in Palestine. And at the time, the indigenous people did not have the national identity and sense of national liberation movement that the Palestinians had. Uh, secondly, and that's very important, I think that um, when I talk about the disintegration of Israel, I am reporting to you the disintegration of Israel. I'm not predicting the disintegration of Israel. I spend a long time every year in Israel. I'm reporter. I'm your, your reporter because you cannot trust ARD, ZDF. Uh, uh, your newspapers, you cannot trust them. They don't know, they don't tell you the truth of what's happening in Israel. I'm your reporter for the night. I'm your reporter for the night. This is not working. This is not working. It's, it doesn't mean that when it's not working, they cannot bomb to death people in Gaza and in Lebanon. Don't confuse the ability to destroy Lebanon and the Gaza Strip with a successful state. That's not an indication for a place that is good to live in. The fact that you are genociding another people and now you are invading another country does not mean that in, in a, a book of political science you would say, oh, that's how a student should define a successful state. No, usually it's a definition of a state that is not very successful. If it has to genocide other people, and it has to invade everyone around it, and to frighten everyone around it, and alienate everyone around it. No, this is something that uh, I say to someone who was born in Israel and, and care a lot, of, a lot about people in Israel, and care a lot of the things that they did do there. So I'm not only saying it because and I definitely want to see Palestine free and decolonized, but I also don't want necessarily to see other people suffering because of that. So I'm, I'm really saying this as, as a, a scientific, if you want, observation of what already goes on. I don't know exactly how it will mature, how it will end, what will be after it, but I'm saying to you it's happening. Interestingly enough, I'm not the only one who says it. You can read quite a lot of people in Haaretz that say the same, I'm not here, the, the only uh, uh, nutcase who says it. It's uh, uh, people with, uh, 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 who, who are there know it as well as, as I do. So, so this is not a matter of optimism or pessimism. This is happening. The question, where is it going? How long it will happen? Because the longer it happens without a solution, the more suffering it causes, and the Palestinians will be the main victims of this suffering. That's why we, we have to take it uh, as seriously. Um, uh, the uh, question of, I, I liked in, in, in the 101 questions that I had from him, <laughs> I liked two questions. Uh, so I choose two. Uh, one, one is, I think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, and I, I hinted to this in my talk. In order to envision uh, a Jewish life in a post-apartheid uh, Palestine, and in decolonized Palestine, it is very healthy and very important to remember how Jews lived in the Arab world. I totally agree with you. <coughs> I think it's very important to remind us of the coexistence, the genuine coexistence, between Muslim, Jews, and Christians, especially in Palestine. Especially in Palestine. It existed elsewhere, but it was particularly notable in Palestine. I don't know if you know 
but there was a thriving Jewish community in Gaza. I don't know if you know that. For many years, and the, the, the Muslims and the, uh, uh, the, the leaders of the Muslim community and the leaders of the Jewish community during the times of the Ottomans cooperated when they thought that European interests are undermining the interests of the people of Gaza. There are many, many examples of that history that historians don't tell us because it doesn't fit the idea that Jews, Muslims, and Christians cannot live together unless uh, it's, it's a Zionist state. So it's important to revisit this model, not to idealize it. It was under the Turks, it was under the Ottomans, it had its own issues and problems, but to be inspired by it. To be inspired by it and understand that this is the, the, the supermarket where we're going to buy ideas for the future, not in Europe. That's our supermarket of ideas. The past, the legacies, the heritage of an area that before uh, uh, colonialism and imperialism no, knew how to create a mosaic of live and let live. That's very important. The second question, yeah, thank you. I like the question of Rasan Abu Sita, my good friend. So first of all, I must tell you that after your question, I probably won't be able to come to Germany. <laughs> and secondly, to say to you that fortunately, I have a German passport, and that's it. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons. Now, I'm using it for my benefit, but maybe after this talk, uh, even that would not be enough. I can always talk to you by Zoom. I'm not, uh, I'm not afraid of uh, any decisions by the German government. Thank you. So um, we will go for the last uh, three uh, three questions. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the people with the mics so they can come up for the front. People up yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, so can you please come um, to the front with the mic? So uh, we'll start from this row and then uh, we'll do these three questions here. I'm very sorry, we, uh, we, there's a lot of questions, but we'll try to accommodate everyone mm -hmm. as, as much as we can. So, yeah. Thank you very much for the insightful lecture and panel. I wanted to ask you about liberal Zionism and groups that support normalization. Um, the narrative that they're spreading that they only blame Netanyahu and the right wing in Israel how do you respond to this narrative that they're spreading, and how is it harmful to the Palestinian liberation movement? Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we take the question on the, yeah, here next to you? Hello, Ilan. Um, so I am kind of struggling a bit with this idea on the one hand in the context of feeling rage and sadness and depression, of course, it is somewhat comforting to feel that we are on the right side of history. But I'm wondering you know, how to play that out in terms of teaching and talking about Israel and Palestine right now. Because on the one hand, I mean, when we're organizing, so I'm teaching at university, when we're organizing events on Palestine, only specific people come who are already kind of thinking the same thing, and I have the sort of feeling it might be somewhat similar here. Mm -hmm. Then my colleagues who are sort of on the other side, on the wrong side, organize their thing and once in a while I attend online and I'm appalled by what is going on there. So I guess my question is without falling into the trap of some idea of neutrality, which I find also very dangerous, but how do we actually manage in a, at a time when narrative is so central, how do we manage to actually talk across? How can we engage? I do feel, you know, as much as it's so comforting, especially in Berlin, and just come from the States here, to 
to be in a place where everyone is cheering you on, <laughs> and I'm cheering you on as well. But um, it's also, you know, it's sad to know that, well, all the people who are not going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do about that? What are we who are sort of trying to teach or talk, what should we do about it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. And yeah, it was really amazing to hear something like this. I wish something like this would happen at universities everywhere in Germany. Like it would be so vital. But my question is, speaking as from someone who's basically living in the heart of the empire, how, what are our strategies? As you kind of mentioned that politics are so easy and so hard to change. We have basically no influence. We've been protesting forever. What, in your perspective, also from a historical perspective, what can we do, people who are living maybe in, in Germany, UK, US, who are literally in the, in the heart of the empire that's supporting Israel, what is, in your opinion, our, our contribution to liberation? Like, what should we do? Okay. All right. Um, sorry that we're cutting it short. Uh, but um, we're not cutting it short, it's actually very long, but uh, <laughs> cutting short, we should have been here until the morning, but uh, I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning tomorrow. So uh, um, um, the three good questions, I think, also helped me to summarize and so on. The question about liberal Zionism, I think, yes, for many years, the fact that um, a very important group of the Israeli elite uh, was trying to reconcile universal values with the very uh, clear nat nature of Zionism as settler colonialism uh, was uh, uh, very convenient for the world uh, that supported Israel uh, as, as a group that explains what's happening in Israel. Uh, what I mean by that, that uh, they succeeded for a while, but not for too long, both inside Israel and outside Israel, to claim that there, is, there are some possible uh, situation in history that can only uh, happen in Israel, surprisingly. For example, the liberal Zionists say you can be a liberal occupier. Nowhere in the world you can be a liberal occupier. In the West Bank you can be a liberal occupier. Or as the Israelis call it, enlightened occupier. <laughs> Kibush Nao. Then you say, I can be a progressive ethnic cleanser. <laughs> and then I can be a socialist genocider. All these impossible uh, oxymorons where the major contribution of liberal Zionism, first of all, for themselves, because liberal Zionists are also liberal, or socialists. So they really care about universal values, but they knew they don't work in Palestine, and it made them feel better. They thought with words that they solved the problem. It made those who supported them in the West and had any other issue shown liberalism, socialism, progressiveness, but not on Palestine, to say, ah, that's why we are supporting occupation and racism and ethnic cleansing. It's a unique, it's a unique case. I, 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 I remember when I was one of the first in Israel, not, not in the academia. Of course, uh, in politics, there are many, many before me who did it but introduced the idea of, of Zionism as colonialism, I was told by my professors, no, you don't understand. What the Zionists did was colon colonizatoring, or something like this in Hebrew, it sounds better. Uh, they used the word colonization, but they added few letters to it to say to me, it's a unique kind of colonialism. Supposedly moral enlightenment justified. So. so I think, yes, they played a very important role in immunizing Israel, but they are gone. Do you know any real liberal Zionists? I don't know many of them anymore. 
they are extinct uh, species. Uh, nobody in Israel believes in them anymore. They believe in the right, in the center, but not in liberal Zionists. Because also the Israeli electorate is tired of these games. They say, OK, you say that we can be either democratic or Jewish. So we prefer to be Jewish, even at the expense of being democratic. Your many efforts to say we can be both is tiring, exhausting, and anyone, anyway, most people in the world do not believe us. So, so I think that's very important. Historically, they played a role. I don't think they're an important and significant uh, force uh, uh, today. Uh, the second, uh, I have to help me, I'm a bit tired. Uh, how, how to talk to those How to talk to, yeah, yeah beyond the um, usual suspects. I, I think uh, it's very important to uh, understand where does, where do many people in the public receive their information about Palestine? You go to the universities, you go to the press. Uh, but let's, let's find the areas where we can create the fundamental change. I will give an example. I don't care how many professors in German universities are here today. I even care less how many of them join the demonstrations. Yeah, that's why I say I don't care. But I do care if they are willing, as some of them are beginning to will, to want, to say, wait a minute, we have to rethink where do we teach about Israel and Palestine in the academia. Because we in Germany are very proud. We have great programs about decolonization, gender studies. We're very progressive academics. Uh, but we teach Israel in the political science department, in the management of conflicts, in peace studies, Jewish studies. Try to teach it as part of studying colonization, of studying racism, studying genocide. These are long-term processes that can be enacted, of course not in every university, not in every department, but it's very good to try and, for example, take the universities as a place that produces information before even arguing what should be the information, to ask the question, where is the information dealt with? Uh, so I think that uh, we should be uh, also optimistic about the role of alternative media. If one thing I notice, maybe it hasn't happened in Germany yet, but one thing I've noticed in the United States, for sure, and in Britain, for sure, there's le very little confidence among many people, especially young people, in the mainstream media as a source of information. That never happened before. You know, people in the New York, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and Washington T Times would say, or Washington Post, I'm sorry, Washington Post would say, at least when it comes to us, the three most serious, uh, 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 trustworthy newspapers, everybody believes us. Not anymore. Not after last year. People go to Electronic Intifada. They go to Palestine Chronicle. They go to uh, Middle East Eye. We, most of my friends in America don't read the the newspapers and don't listen to the TV. They go to the alternative media. And, there are, and, and you mentioned how many new faces in America we saw that are using these information sources. So there is a change in the media, in the academia, uh, uh, that uh, has to be enhanced, has to, to, be, to be definitely uh, 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 with thinking out of the box and so on. But I do think we know where we should work. I know where we should work to reach more people and not to give up on the, that kind of, or the sections of the public that are not necessarily against what we believe in, but are not very interested in it, or are being fed um, by manufactured kind of consensus and ideas that come from mainstream media. Finally, 
the question of uh, what uh, can be done. I think that last year showed us uh, uh, the university students showing the way of what can be done with the encampments, the demands for divestment. I think it was very important. It helped to bring Palestine back to the center of attention. I think we saw uh, the BDS movement as becoming far more spread and successful in areas we didn't think it would be successful when trade unions withdrew their investments from, from Israel. Uh, universities, maybe not in Germany, but in many parts of the West, are not collaborating anymore with Israeli universities. It's frustrating because it's a very slow process of change compared to the very quick process of destruction on the land itself. I understand there is a gap. And probably our role is to narrow the gap between the quick destruction and the slow change, which is happening. But it's too slow for the people in Gaza. It's too po slow for the people in Jenin. It's too slow for the people in South Lebanon. So we need to make uh, the gap uh, 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 narrower. But I think we know what we should do. I don't have to tell you. I think you know what, what you should do. It's just a question of, there are probably two questions, and with this I would end. One is, uh, and maybe you need to be, to be involved in this for 50 years to, to understand, not to understand it, but kind of feel it. It's not understanding, it's, a, it's an emotion. That uh, you, there's a certain moment when you don't ask yourself if what I did, did it change anything? What are the dividends of what I did? You don't ask this question anymore. You're not checking whether the fact that you are so committed, not you, of course, yourself, but with everyone else, the fact that you go to every demonstration, the fact that you are joining the BDS movement, the, the fact that you are everywhere where you can in support of Palestine, you don't check every few months to say, but the situation hasn't changed. So, no, that's, you stop asking that question. The only question you ask, can I do a bit more? Although I'm doing it wrong. That's, only, that's the only question. That's the only question. That's the only question. And the second one is, is, is very difficult, but, but very, very important, uh, is that, I, I, and, and I know there are some, I don't know how many, but there are Palestinians here uh, today. And I think they would tell you they will tell you, and I feel it when I go to the refugee camp in Janine uh, and uh, in, in Nablus and so on, I'm always kind of fearful talking to, to people in the refugee camps because I will tell them about BDS and so on, and I'm afraid that they would say to me, so what, you know, the Israelis are still doing what they did yesterday and will do the same tomorrow. But I also find out that it's very important for people to know that you are talking about them, that you are thinking about them, that you care about them. They don't think that you are superhumans. They don't think that you are superhumans that can tomorrow change the policy of Germany. But they want to know that they are not alone and you're thinking about them, you're working for their uh, liberation and salvation. I think that's very, very important. Uh, I'm not saying that one cannot be depressed by, by what's going on, but at least think about, and with this I will end, I, I keep thinking about it. You know, when I think about the Holocaust, and I think about the Holocaust a lot of us because of what happened to my family, and I keep thinking, God, if I could have returned to that period and be a hero, and maybe I could have, you know, saved the family, saved the Jews, and so on, but I understand this, chapter is gone. You are in a chapter of discrimination, racism, violence, that you can do something about. I cannot do anything against Nazism. It's already over. But you can do something against what's happening to the Palestinian. That's a good feeling. It's a good feeling that you are not watching a film about the future, and you're not watching a film about the past. You are part of the film and you are actors in it, and you, you are not onlookers, 
And all the processes that we are talking about that could be better, that could change, we are not sitting here to see if they are coming better, getting better. We are here because we believe we can make them better. Thank you. 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 Thank you.